thank you very much. And welcome to everyone. Apologies for the late start. Um, we are pitchup.com. Um, my name is Dan Yates. I'm the founder and I'm joined by Alex Russell, who's our head of sales. Today, we're going to be talking about the 56 day camping opportunity, which is following on from the extension in the government's permitted development rules that they announced last June and then extended throughout 2021. The format of today, just very quickly, um, we're going to have a very quick poll um, in the background, uh, which is going to be asking you about whether you've heard of this exemption or, or this opportunity before. Um, that's going to happen in a moment when we're talking through uh, the introduction. Uh, there's then going to be another poll, um, and then Alex and I will present for about 25 minutes. We'll, we'll try and go as quickly as possible, given the time constraints. And then at the end, a couple of other quick polls as we go into questions and answers. Um, thank you for submitting so many interesting questions, and we'll do our absolute best to get as many of them answered today. So very quickly, this um, presentation is going to have three elements. Firstly, a bit of background about uh, pitchup.com, the camping market, and what's happened during COVID. Secondly, how you might get started if it was of interest. And thirdly, how pitchup works. So a, a little bit, a bit about us first. So um, I uh, am lucky enough to come from a family, uh, three generations of which own static caravans, literally aunts, uncles, um, grandparents on both sides um, for the last 50 years or so. And I was born and brought up, or at least brought up on Holiday Park in Willicombe in North Devon. And uh, my, my parents then bought a, a slightly bigger one in Croyd, uh, Ruda is quite well known. Um, and that's where I got my first experience of permitted development because during university, set up a 28 day site on the back of the, the, back of the dunes um, called Surface Paradise. And that was in an AOMB uh, right next to a triple SI and on the heritage coast. So about as sensitive as it could be and surrounded by residential housing for those of you who know Croyd, pretty much on all sides. Founded pitchup.com about 10 years ago after spending four minutes, uh, sorry, four years at lastminute.com um, where I realized that this was really the, the only part of the travel market left that didn't have this type of what they call an online travel agent to make, make bookings across a large number of properties. I'll just hand over to Alex Russell, who's um, going to say a few words. Hi there. Thanks very much for uh, joining us today. Um, my name is Alexander Russell. I'm the head of sales at pitchup.com, which I joined in 2017. Uh, prior to that, I worked at Groupon for around seven to eight years, uh, working mainly with the kind of hotels and some outdoor accommodation, which then obviously led me into sort of starting at Pitchup. Uh, and I've been living between London and Cornwall, where a lot of my family live in um, Port Levin in Cornwall. Uh, so I've kind of been sort of dotting between there over the last few years. And you'll see there are a few other logos uh, on the page. And, and so we do have members of the team from Booking.com, from Secret Escapes, from Mr. and Mrs. Smith, and lots of similar online travel companies. Um, so now you hopefully you've, you've finished the first poll now. There's going to be another poll. Just uh, this is the last one at this point of the presentation. Um, but I'll carry on talking so we can, we can make some progress. So pitchup.com is um, the leading online travel agent for outdoor holidays around the world. So on the right, you can see a very quick idea of what we do. Um, we uh, put up a page for your, uh, for, your, for your property, your campsite, holiday park, glamping site on our website. As you can imagine, most of the bookings these days are made by phone rather than by uh, tablet, which has declined a great deal. Uh, there's still a considerable number coming in by desktop, but phone has overtaken laptops and desktop now. Um, we do this for almost 5,000 sites around the world, but about half of them are in the UK, particularly um, at the moment. We have uh, over 20 million annual visits to the site and every year we sell about 3 million total nights. And in a normal year, I'd be waxing lyrical about the opportunity to sell your pitches to Dutch campers, to French campers, German campers and all the rest of it. And we have actually translated our website into 17 languages overall. But this year, as you can imagine, it's very much going to be a staycation market targeting Brits. So I, I touched on this just now, but this is just to give you an idea of the breadth of accommodation that we cover on PitchUp. So we, we do specialize in a market that we call outdoor accommodation, but that can range from everything from teepees, yurts and wigwams. So you're, you're glamping through to traditional static caravans, through to lodges, cabins, pods, tree houses and huts. And then on the uh, bottom row, what we call the bring your own categories. So the motorhome and campervan pitches, touring caravan pitches, and then the focus of today, tent pitches. Here is a selection of the, if you like, the more unconventional clients that we're currently working with. 
um, with the possible exception of the Caravan and Motown Club. But for the most part, we, as you can imagine, have the traditional campsites and caravan parks around the UK and, and increasing numbers of glamping sites. But these are some of the organizations that have come on board, uh, several of which as a result of the, the changes in permissive development rights. So for example, Hokum Hall in Norfolk has um, set up a pop-up campsite. Uh, Buclew Estate has as well in Scotland at the bottom left. Uh, Girl Guiding has um, and, and Castle Howard, and they've done tremendously well. So we do have a, an, in, an interesting uh, diverse client base now, certainly compared to where we were a year ago. Very briefly to touch on what last year looked like for us. Um, I know that uh, this time last year, we were just seeing the glimmers of hope in some of the speeches coming from Downing Street, but April was an absolute disaster. I think we were 98% down on 2019, which is the blue line. Um, and then things got a bit better as the speeches became a bit more encouraging. And then as soon as I think it was the 4th of July in England happened, things absolutely hit the reef, roof and our servers were almost sort of bursting into flames before my eyes. So we were having to invest heavily in new infrastructure and new equipment um, in order to withstand the huge demand that we saw throughout July and August and even going into September and October. And actually last year, there was so much pent up demand from that initial period at the start. And you can see the huge gap between the blue and orange lines in the spring, that, that much of that carried over into September and October. And that's actually when we saw the biggest annual growth. I also wanted just, just to show how resilient camping and caravanning has been. Um, and we're lucky that some of the big operators in the hotel and the self-catering side of the market are quoted on the stock market in America. And so we're, and we're, able, we're already able to see how they performed last year. And if you look at Airbnb, Expedia and Booking, Booking Holdings, which is booking.com, um, they were down between 40 and 60% year on year, uh, so versus 2019 during the first three quarters of last year. So that's January to September. Pitchup.com on the other hand was down 3% and actually in the UK, we were up 11%. And I think that really just goes, as I say, to, to illustrate the resilience of this sector. And um, of course, media was full of the, the fact that outdoor holidays were really an opportunity to, to naturally socially distance and tended to be in the open air. Um, apologies, this is yet another graph, but um, I really wanted to include this as a, an illustration of quite how large the opportunity is this year. Um, I know that some of the questions revolve around, is this going to continue into future years? And we can talk about that a bit later, but certainly for now, the, the sheer scale of the outdoor accommodation, uh, sorry, of the, uh, foreign holiday market is, is absolutely vast. It's about 500 million nights spent um, by British people abroad. That's based on 2019. And uh, domestically, the figure is only about 200 million. So almost three times bigger. Um, and obviously this year, that top, that top chart is, is just not gonna happen and, and anything like that scale. Now, clearly there's no way that that entire volume is going to be able to, to be accommodated within the domestic market. But one of the advantages of pop-up campsites is that we can go, go some way towards soaking up some of that demand. And you can see that by comparison, the entire domestic camping and caravan market, the traditional market, if you like, based on 2019, is only 55 million nights. So it's one tenth of the size of the foreign holiday market. And of course, the regulations that are affecting foreign holidays and, and the general sentiment around foreign holidays has contributed to very significant growth in our company over the last four months. So we've just updated these figures for May's uh, monthly figures. And you can see that the, the growth is 100% plus since um, since uh, regulations started to be, and since the announcement started in February and they started to be relaxed from April. And really this was the lifeline that has enabled temporary campsites to flourish. The 56 day rule, as we call it, many of you will be familiar with the 28 day rule, which applies to all sorts of uh, uses of land, car parks, campsites, um, temporary events of all kinds. Um, and Robert Jenrick actually extended this rule back in June for the rest of 2020 uh, from 28 days to 56 days in England. And then we were very happy to see that he decided to continue that throughout 2021. Um, and of course, he announced it in November. So giving organizations much longer to plan for this year's camping season. And, and it's allowed many larger organizations who perhaps weren't able to act as quickly last year to also get involved. Um, the slides will be circulated afterwards, so I don't want to go through every syllable of this slide, but um, I just wanted to outline some of the other factors that are behind the growth of the market. So um, many of you will remember the airport blockades that happened, um, Extinction Rebellion, for example, 
um, were at Heathrow um, in the early part of last year. And sustainability has been an issue uh, for the overseas travel sector for some time. Of course, the camping sector very rarely requires any form of air travel, and people tend to do quite sustainable activities when they arrive, um, and they stay in quite sustainable accommodation, whether it's a, a pitch, you know, clearly zero resource, um, but even the, the cabins and lodges tend to be built from locally produced materials and be very eco-friendly, um, certainly compared to a package holiday in, in, in uh, Andalusia, perhaps. The second point I've already alluded to, so this is, it's clearly going to be a big staycation market this year. And again, that plays into the hands of the camping and caravanning market because over 95% of visitors, even a, norm, a normal year, are domestic. So it, 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 the market is well placed to absorb some of that extra demand. Affordability, clearly lots of people uh, are in not such a great financial position and, and unemployment has been rising. Uh, this is clearly the least uh, expensive form of accommodation with an average trip spend of £23 per person per night in the country. And I think that also ties into what we're calling the lure of the countryside. So there has been this, this sense of nostalgia that people have gone back to um, almost childhood activities, simple pleasures we're calling them, during lockdown and, and rediscovered that part of, of, their, um, of, of their lifestyle. And that's, that's really, I think, again, pushed people towards natural environments and particularly camping and caravanning. And actually, the government's chief medical officer did say this time last year that it is, an, it is absolutely a biological truism that outdoor, outdoor environments are much less of a risk than indoor environments. And then lastly, um, it used to be said that there, were, there was around 60% uh, of the population who just wouldn't dream of going on a camping or caravan holiday. And our belief is that with the rise of glamping over the last decade or so, and then with the rise of the pop-up camp sites we've seen over the last year or so, which have, have been set up at everything from uh, race courses to uh, orchards to farms to stately homes there really is something for everyone in this sector now and again i won't i won't go through this in detail but really these are the answers from an industry survey to why people go camping and caravanning and it really just reinforces those ideas of proximity to nature a sense of relaxation health and well-being and affordability and really, these are the things that the population is crying out for after the cabin fever that we've all suffered from for the last year or so. So that was just a quick bit of context. Uh, next, I'm going to talk about how to get started. So again, I uh, apologize, apologize for the density of this slide, but it will be circulated afterwards. What it aims to do is to lay out the three different ways that you can create a campsite. So on the left-hand side, you can see the first option is permitted development, which is what we're talking about today. Now, that is 56 days in not just in England, but also in Wales as of, as of about six weeks ago. In Scotland and Northern Ireland, it's still only 28 days, but Scotland, uh, in fact, both countries have a fairly, um, have, 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 have um, published a pretty lenient policy on uh, how those limits are applied. One very important point here is that any movable structures such as portable reception, portable toilets, or portable showers, which are allowed under the 56 days, they do also start the clock running on the 56 days. So uh, if they are in place, it doesn't matter whether anyone is on the land, that is using up days from your 56 day allowance. Days don't have to be consecutive. Um, so you could uh, theoretically remove the toilets and showers, or perhaps you already have built toilets and showers, um, and then take a break and, for example, um, I mean, obviously the bank holiday is gone now, but some people would take the, the uh, late May bank holiday and then come back in mid-July and take the remainder of the 56 days. And then the last point I would make is that uh, the 56 days only relates to the temporary use of the land for tent camping, uh, not touring caravans, not camper vans, not motorhomes, not pods, not yurts, etc. cetera. Um, and any sort of engineering works or building operations like building a toilet block or some kind of excavation would still need planning permission. Um, and you, you would also need to just assure yourself that, that, they haven't, that the permissive development rights have not been removed. Um, that might have been done via a Section 106 agreement, which is an agreement with your local planning authority. Or if, for example, you, you, you have an Article 4 direction, which is where the local authority um, imposes a, 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 a rule to remove the permissive, permissive development rights altogether, but they are relatively rare. We'll come on to that, that a bit more later. The second way of setting up a campsite is a planning application. So that's um, a change of use, for example, is nearly 500 pounds. And um, the guideline 
time frame for a decision is eight weeks. Um, I know that many councils are either significantly below or significantly above that. And the third way is what's called an exempt organization. And these are organizations like the Caravan and Motorhome Club, the Camping and Caravanning Club, and newer organizations like the Greener Camping Club and the Freedom Camping Club. And they actually have powers from government to um, essentially exempt you from the license and the planning permission requirement. Um, but I know that there is about a, a couple of months lead time on these uh, decisions. So um, it, it may be too late for this season for that. The other point I just wanted to raise on this slide was on, on the right hand side, planning permission is only part of the equation. There is also a requirement for a license and that would be administered by the licensing team in your council, so not the planning team. A camping license, which is for tents, is not needed unless you have more than 42 days consecutive tent camping or more than 60 days non-consecutive tent camping. So what many of our clients will do is to have a, a, a continuous period of 41 days or 42 days even um, from around the 20th of July until August bank holiday and then a gap immediately before it and then the remainder of the 56 days, so the remaining 14 days or so. And unlike planning permission, just to be extra confusing, what triggers the camping license is actually having tents on the land. So portable toilets and showers will not have an impact there. Um, if you wanted to go and look, if you wanted to go down the caravan route, um, and that would include, as I say, camper vans, touring caravans, pods, and so on, then that's a, a different ball game because a, 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 a license is required for any caravans on the land. And um, there are a couple of very minor exceptions for uh, five acres or more, um, or, or twenty-eight day use for one caravan. But by and large, you would need a license. And whether you got a camping license or a caravan site license, that would co cover everything from uh, the number of toilets and showers, for example, fire safety issues, access issues, and the number of units you might have. As I said, we'll circulate these slides afterwards, and this is a flowchart we've um, we've drawn up to try and cut through all that complexity so that you can literally just follow it down based on what you want. But you can see the um, the green, the first green bubble um, towards the bottom. That is what, I, what I've been talking about. So where you you don't have a continuous period of more than forty two days, and then just above that you don't have more than 56 days consecutive camping. And as long as you comply with those two, you shouldn't need a camping license or planning permission. Next, I wanted to just give a quick idea of when people come onto the site to help decide when is the best period to use. So this is based on 2019, so normal times. Um, you can see the first two boxes are actually the, the um, uh, Easter uh, bank holiday and then the early May bank holiday. And then the green one is spring bank holiday, which 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 we're kind of in. Uh, and then there's normally a bit of a lull until uh, peak season kicks off at the start of July, and then the school holidays kick in. And it goes it goes ballistic. Um, and then you can see things tail off fairly quickly after August bank holiday. Now this year our our expectation is obviously the weather. It's hugely dependent on the weather, but our expectation is for a much more buoyant June. Um, so the reason why the, the graph is so spiky is because the weekends are considerably busier than the middle of the week. Um, and then, uh, as I said earlier, the demand to continue into September and October because there, so much of it has, has got pent up during the first part of the year. And then I also just wanted to very quickly um, illustrate the popularity of camping versus glamping searches. So this is data from Google. And the yellow line is the number of searches for glamping in the United Kingdom over the last year. And the red line is camping and the blue line is caravan. So we always say that, yes, the glamping sector is growing very, very quickly, but don't discount the camping sector. It is still significantly larger in volume terms um, and should be for some years to come. I should point out that bell tents qualify under the definition of tents. So the 56 day rule is not just about people bringing their own tents. It's also, it also covers the situation where if you wanted to erect your own tent, as long as there wasn't any kind of planning, uh, any, any of what they call operational development involving excavations, in installations of um, significant platforms and that, that kind of thing, then bell tents would also be covered by the rule. So now I'm just gonna hand, hand over to Alex, who's gonna run through you, uh, run through some of the financial side of the uh, setup. Thanks very much, Dan. Um, so really, I mean, I imagine what quite a few of you are wondering at the moment is how much can you earn? Um, so as you can see on the left-hand side there, we put some average pricing, uh, nightly pricing uh, for some different types of pitch types. Uh, the average pricing on our website for a tent pitch is usually between 20 to 26 pounds uh, and similar for a tech caravan or motorhome. Um, 
to give you an idea about kind of rough pricing in terms of how much sites have earned, uh, last year from sort of July, and some of this was actually only an eight-week period from when they were able to open in July, uh, sites were on average earning about £12,500 in bookings. Uh, we did have quite a few sites um, that earned well over sort of £50,000 uh, in their first week with a pop-up site. Um, and then I had even a couple, there was a bell tent site in Dorset, which I think in their first three months over earned over £98,000 in booking. So the potential is huge. Um, a representative uh, sort of 56 day tent pitch income is roughly about sort of four to 500 pounds. Um, to give you an idea of rough dimensions, because the tented obviously accommodation is really based on sort of your acreage and you're sort of governed by how much, I suppose, space you have. Um, an average tent pitch is roughly seven meters square, so about 22 feet square. Um, so a lot of sites, to give you a, an approximation, are looking about 50 tent pitches uh, per acre, uh, but due usually to sort of obviously lower density because of COVID, uh, they're obviously sort of reducing that. 56% um, of bookings uh, are for electric hookups as well. Um, but that's just to give you a bit of a, an understanding of kind of the rough financials of it. The next slide. Uh, in terms of toilets and showers, there isn't any sort of, I suppose, formal legislation to say you need per Tent, this many tent pitches, you need X amount of showers. Um, this is really kind of what we recommend. Um, so this is based on a 60 tent pitch site. Uh, we would recommend approximately four toilets for women and two for men, uh, as well as four wash hand basins for women, four for men, uh, and two showers for men and two for women. Um, the other things that you need to think about are safe drinking water, um, People, areas where they can put their rubbish, um, potentially electricity supplies or generators, um, septic tanks, uh, depending on if it's going to be main sewers or treatment and things like that. Uh, and the other things you need to think about is obviously arrivals uh, and evening cover. If you're going to be having people sort of arrive, um, sort of uh, saying hello to people and obviously greeting them when they arrive and when they leave and things like that. Um, access is something you should think about as well. Um, depending on the size of the roads, you might not be able, it might not be suitable for potentially a camper van or something. So it's something to think about. Um, what you do need legally is public liability insurance. It's something that every site needs to have. If you don't have it already, it's something you need to look into. Um, apart from that, in terms of COVID things that you need to kind of do, uh, there's an NHS QR code poster uh, that should be displayed and also some test and trace customer detail collections that you need to do. Um, but apart from that, um, that's really sort of the main uh, sort of things that you need to think about. In terms of these are more sort of uh, kind of, I suppose, the uh, all the farms and a lot of the businesses that we're working with at the moment can offer a huge amount more. Um, so they can offer things like fresh produce or they have a lot of them have animal experiences. Um, the incremental revenue that you can make from people while they're on site, these people are predisposed to be spreading money with you. Um, so things like firewood or if there's any food or sort of eggs, bacon, cheese, milk, anything like that, you could potentially that you might produce uh, on site or anything or that you might be able to provide for them, um, they're going to be much more inclined to be spending money with you while they're there. Um, they may only be bringing £25 a night to come and stay, uh, or spending £25 a night to come and stay, but they might be bringing £100 spending money in their pocket for the weekend. Um, and it's best to kind of try and take as much of that as you can and try and think of incremental ways that you can make money uh, from them while they're on site. Um, we have over 800 farms taking bookings via pitch up at the moment. Um, and as I said, it's about £12,500 was the average in, in generation of revenue last year. Just a couple of other things that you can think about, as you already mentioned, the organic produce uh, that you can obviously provide. Uh, fire pits and campfires are kind of innovative ideas to kind of help attract more customers. Um, but yeah, those are just a couple of things that you can think about to sort of improve the site. Next slide. So yeah, j just just very quickly on that one, I, I would also comment that it may be necessary to get uh, another license if you're doing something like a takeaway or any, obviously anything involving alcohol. So do you bear that in mind? Just a little bit now about how pitch up works. So we are the market leader for outdoor accommodation, as Dan mentioned. We list over 4,000 campsites, pop-up campsites around the world for people to book uh, that, their holiday. Um, we know exactly what people are looking to book, uh, and we basically spend what it takes to make sure that they see your listing. So basically, 
there are no fees in terms of sign up. Uh, we just charge a commission per booking. So there's no joining fees, there's no um, monthly costs, there's no exclusivity clauses or contractual time periods. We just charge a commission per booking. Um, and we've got a very personalized search uh, and straightforward booking function, uh, which is obviously 24-7. Uh, and we handle the whole booking process uh, and we just send you send you the customers. In terms of your listing, you can tailor your listing to exactly how you would like it. So if you only wanted to allow uh, adults, no children, uh, no dogs allowed, you can tailor it to exactly how you'd like it. Obviously, if you want the opposite of that and you wanted groups and families and children, you can do that as well. Uh, but the listing is completely ta tailorizable. I think that's this word, um, for you to be able to sort of make it exactly how you'd like it. Uh, and it's, I suppose it's a good thing that obviously every single site is slightly different and offering a slightly different option. In terms of the listing, it's very simple. You can sign up on our website. Um, we basically give you uh, access to a portal where you can, as, as I said, start adding images and description of a surrounding area, and you can control your preferences in terms of who you'd like to try and attract. Um, if you did happen, it mentions there about booking systems, if you did happen to maybe go down the full planning route later on or the exempt organization route and decided to uh, adopt your own external booking system, we integrate with about 90 different booking systems across the world. Um, but in terms of the, I suppose, the way it works is, as I said, there's no there's no sign up fees, there's no monthly costs, there's just a commission per booking, uh, which is very straightforward. In terms of payments, how it works is, so let's say someone was charging £20 a night for easy maths. Uh, we would take a 15% deposit, which would be £3 at the time of booking, which is also our commission. Uh, and then we would either transfer you the remaining £17 balance of that £20 booking directly into your account prior to the customer arriving, which, as it says here, 60% of our campsites are choosing this. Or if you'd like to, you can receive the balance on arrival if you wanted to pay people to pay on arrival. Uh, I think more and more are choosing uh, in advance, obviously due to COVID and things like that. Um, but it is an option for you if you wanted to take the balance on arrival, you can do that. Um, just one thing to mention about um, sites on average will usually, uh, I would say, set about between six to eight weeks in advance, usually before arrival. Um, and they'll usually receive the payment before then. But it's a very, very simple process, but you can choose either. We are also, with every single booking, we are sending out a, um, a countryside confirmation with the countryside code, with all of our booking confirmations. So that will be sent out. I think we've noticed that I think the government over the last sort of 20 years have spent uh, a very small amount of money communicating this information. And there's going to be a huge amount, maybe even millions of people who are potentially going to be going from urban environments to the countryside where they've never, ever been before. Um, so we are trying to basically communicate this information as best as possible with every single confirmation that we send and we're also campaigning all sorts of associations to try to get the government to do probably some tv advertising prior to kind of peak season in july and august one other thing that we'd mention here is we have a uh, mobile app so you can actually just in case someone you were to get kind of drop-ins on the day you can manage your bookings uh, directly from your mobile which is an option for you as well one thing that we, <coughs> excuse me, we do offer, um, because obviously a lot of the sites and landowners and farms uh, very often sometimes might have not the best Wi-Fi, we offer um, text message notification for, for your bookings as well. Uh, so in addition to the email confirmation that you'll get at the time of booking with all the details of the uh, of their booking, uh, you can also get a text message as well, because we do understand that a lot of sites and landowners and farms sometimes don't have the best Wi-Fi. Um, and you can also collect uh, connect your uh, pitch-up bookings to your Google Calendar, if you wish. Uh, one thing to mention here is that you can set, obviously, when you're setting up your listing, you can decide on what time you'd like people to arrive and what time you'd like them to leave. Um, I have done quite a few webinars uh, recently where we had some pop-up campsites who had uh, been live with us last year, and they were doing it again this year. Uh, and one thing, they were giving some feedback to some of the sites on the webinar, and they basically said one thing to mention was that any site, any time that you put on there, so if you put 11 o'clock, just bear in mind people might turn up earlier. People very often will leave thinking it will take them two and a half hours in the car and they'll generally turn up a bit earlier so just to bear that in mind uh, just some uh, demographics here. So as you can see on the left-hand side, this is the bookings by number of children. Uh, and as you'll see, which is quite interesting, I find that almost 60% of the people booking actually don't have any children at all. Uh, so it's majority couples that will be booking. And on the right-hand side, as you can see, the ones that are booking with children, uh, the majority are not infants. So that kind of 13% represents the kind of, I suppose, pre preschool children, which uh, just in case anyone was worried about, it would be your, your land would be full of screaming children and babies. It's not going to be 
be the case. Just a bit of um, press that obviously we have about six or seven uh, international PR agencies across the world. Um, and obviously over the last sort of 13 months, there's been a huge amount in the press recent, obviously over that time uh, about outdoor accommodation and camping. And I think the one really to highlight here is the kind of the sun's heard it all, Stur surge in staycation books, leaves campsites, UK campsites full to farmers are now opening up their fields to campers from 17 pounds a night. And that really does just kind of highlight what the what the uh, sort of the press and the, and the news has all been about in the last kind of 13 months. Um, and then some other just news coverage that we're getting sort of uh, across the UK. And obviously one that I think was really good to highlight here is uh, Dan when he was on, on Lorraine's, uh, which is obviously Lorraine Kelly's, which is quite a, a well-known uh, TV uh, advertising. So yeah, there's just a huge amount of PR that we're getting at the moment, which uh, I think will continue over the next couple of months. Uh, just a couple of, um, these are testimonials from a couple of the pop-up campsites that we've had last year. Uh, the top one there, Girt Down Farm in Devon, was actually a site that went live last year in the summer, uh, went very well and actually have signed up a second site. Um, there's one thing I may, Dan may have mentioned earlier, but you can obviously, if you have different locations, you can actually do potentially 56 days at one and then 56 days at another. Um, it's also, I think, something Dan's just probably about to mention as well. It's actually down to the parcel of land uh, that you that you have. So if you have 300 acres, let's say, and that was broken up into four different parcels, you can in theory, in theory, do 56 days either consecutively, one after the other, or you could do it at all four locations all at the same time. Anything you're going to mention, Dan? Yeah, I, I, my understanding on that is that the planning unit is quite difficult to break up. So normally shared ownership would be one planning unit. But if, for example, you've got a very dramatic break, like a, a main road going through the middle of the estate or lots of different types of uses, it may be possible to argue you've got different planning units and therefore different 56-day periods. But it's that would be something to check with the local council, I think. Thank you. Um, the last one I actually just wanted to uh, highlight on here was actually the bottom one here, which is the red lion, uh, which I think kind of sort of illustrates some of the incremental revenue that you, you can make from people while they're on site. Um, they found that over 50% of campers were spending around £100 uh, over the weekend in the bar and restaurant. Um, so if there is things that you can think about um, to monetize uh, on site, then please do. Um, this is a video which we will send out, uh, obviously, as part of the presentation afterwards. Uh, it's a little bit too long to play now, but it's basically the uh, testimonial from a farm that we've been working with, uh, just to give their experience of how they found working with us and bookings and things like that. So I think it's worth sort of having a watch in sort of at your leisure. Um, in terms of the presentation, that is most of the information that we wanted to go through. Obviously, there we're going to. I'm going to sort of hand back to Dan now uh, for any sort of some more polls and potentially go through some questions. Um, but I do really appreciate everyone sort of taking the time. And apologies again for the uh, for the late start. Great, thanks very much, Alex. So um, there is actually going to be another poll. Uh, two more quick polls now, um, which just assess your uh, whether we've managed to to change anyone on anyone's views or we've deterred people. Um, so if you could just um, answer those, they should be popping up one after the other just now. Um, and what is uh, coming next is going into the questions. So um, let me finish sharing. Okay. I could start with Gary at the top. Is this applicable to Northern Ireland? Um, so uh, in Northern Ireland, the rule is that uh, it's very similar to Scotland, actually. And I know there was a question about that one, too. And what they've actually said is that we do not expect the limits to the 28-day rule to be enforced against reasonable tem temporary outdoor uses. So essentially, in Scotland and Northern Ireland, there isn't a, a hard increase. So it, it, they haven't said you can go from 28 days to 56 days. But if they've left it a bit sort of furry around so fuzzy around the edges um so i think i think really the uh the the the, the thrust of what they're saying is that if you've got a if you've got a solid tourism use and it, it, it doesn't um cause some uh terrible harm uh to uh, neighbors or to um the the environment in general for example then they will look kindly on this uh on on on, on your use but it, it i think if you're probably if you're going to go over the 28 days it's probably worth just picking up the phone for the local planning authority if you're in scotland or northern ireland just to double check their opinion 
Uh, Jackie asks, can we supply or offer for purchase bottled water instead of drinking water taps? Um, well, my understanding is that safe drinking water is uh, generally, generally a requirement. Um, but I would, again, speak to the Environmental Health Department of the local council and see whether uh, bottled water would be acceptable. Uh, Julie asks, could we do this in the Brecon Beacons National Park? How do the national parks differ on planning? Yes. So there's been a bit of fake news around about whether or not you can have the 56 days in areas about standing on natural beauty and national parks. And the answer is you can. Um, it's just that it's more likely that you're going to find Article 4 directions and um, Article 3 directions, which relate to um, as the conservation areas, essentially European conservation areas and other protected areas. So, um, in fact, we've done we've done several webinars with national parks, which which show that the uh, the permissive development rights absolutely are available in national parks. But I would just advise you to be careful to check whether you've had whether there is a section 106 available, uh, sorry, agreement in place, whether there is an Article 4 in place or an Article 3 in place. And again, a quick call to the planning authority should be able to clear that up. Uh, Alex asks, can you give some advice on advertising or uh, promoting additional advertising and promoting? I'm guessing they're meaning kind of things that they could do. Yeah, so we don't have any exclusivity at PitchUp. Our view is that you should promote your new business as far as what, far and wide as you possibly can. Um, but at the same time, clearly uh, time is ticking away and um, we our, our aim is to offer you the full spectrum of um, marketing services and booking services if you choose to work with us. So many of our clients only work with PitchUp and they uh, have a, a link to PitchUp from their homepage. Um, others list on as many sites as they can. And there are various technologies that allow you to synchronize your availability with all sorts of online travel agents. So um, uh, I, I, I mean, clearly there are lots of free online tools. There's Google My Business. There's um, various listing sites that you could, you could go with. But um, our, our advice would be, um, I think, look at how much capacity you have after developing the site. and um, maybe whether your staff have time to do it, um, given that they might be getting questions from customers over email before arrival and that sort of thing. And by all means, do it um, if, if you have the resources and the time. Okay. Um, John asks, anticipated cost outlay and likely returns. Obviously, I've gone through the returns, but... Yeah, I mean, the returns, the returns is a tricky one because most people didn't get going until the start of August last year. And so the figures that we've been quoting are really just based on a month. And in fact, some campsites in the Lake District, for example, they had to close before August Bank holiday because it was very wet at that time. Um, so it'll be, I guess this year's figures will be a much... A, a much um, a uh, better guide to, uh, to to what you might earn over the course of an entire year. In terms of costs, um, I think it very much depends on your on each specific land holding because obviously the cost of putting in, uh, you might have existing services, um, it may, may be necessary to um, to extend a pipe or something in order to plumb in a, a porta, put portable toilet, um, whether you have um, the, the facilities you have in terms of uh, wastewater and so on could be dramatically different according to um, how far the field is from from the main part of, of the farm, for example. But just as a general guide, insurance, we've heard people being charged a few anything from a few hundred pounds up to almost a thousand pounds to extend their existing farm insurance, for example. Um, planning, planning should not be a cost because it's permitted development, therefore the planning permission effectively already exists. Um, staff costs, I, you know, that's that's relatively low. And and in fact, one site in the Lake District quoted us a margin of around 60% um, or over 60% based on the setup costs and the, the running costs that they'd um, that they'd spent last year. Yeah, and it was based on around £800 a day, wasn't it? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Um, do, do, do you need toilets and showers, Vicky asks? Uh, I mean, 95% of the properties that we work with have toilets and have at least toilets and the vast majority of them have showers so we would always say you will massively broaden your appeal by having both um, but we do recognize that in some parts of the country they are becoming uh, that they are slightly hard to come by at the moment although the fact that so many festivals are being or have been cancelled is releasing more of more portable units onto the market and actually many more bell tents onto the market we believe so um, our, our advice would always be ab absolutely get them if you if you can, because if you have neither, then it is restricting your market, not 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 to sort of Bear Grylls and, and three other people, but, you know, a, a much smaller customer um, base than, than you would otherwise have.
Uh, Lisa asks, if you use vehicles on wheels for guests to stay in, do you still need planning permission, i.e. shepherd's huts or mobile camping vehicles? Uh, I would I, I would say almost certainly that would compl that would be a caravan. So yeah. so so yes. Uh, um, so Simon asked, the staycation market is expected to peak this summer or possibly next. Therefore, what will be the USP for your pop up to continue to flourish? Well, I, I would go back to that figure of 500 million nights abroad <clears throat> that I showed on the slide earlier, which is 10 times the size of the existing camping caravan market. And that's why we believe that there's plenty of demand to go around, not just for existing sites, which are filling up rapidly, uh, but for new sites too. And in fact, it would take only a 1% shift from foreign travel to camping and caravanning to create a 10% uh, growth in the market, uh, sorry, a, a, a doubling in the market. Um, I've got my mouse right. Sorry, a 10% shift of great dog in the market. So um, really, the, the, the market is absolutely huge. And um, the way you would distinguish yourself, in my view, are customer reviews. So customer reviews doesn't necessarily have to be about providing the you know luxury glamping experience uh, at every aspect. It's about, I think, managing people's expectations. And by we have a very comprehensive listing uh, system a pitch up. There's all sorts of there's around 100 facilities that you can tick. There's all sorts of terms conditions that you can use to make it very clear to visitors what they can expect, whether they are they are allowed allowed to have dogs, how many, uh, whether your toilet block is a built toilet block or a porter cabin, that kind of thing. Um, and so as long as I think as long as that stuff is up to date, then you, and 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 the site is well well run, then you will be in line for very strong customer reviews. And what I would actually say is we were very uh, pleased to see that the pop ups last year actually got better reviews than the existing sites. Mm -hmm. um, they got over nine out of 10 on average compared to the average pitch up rating of eight and a half out of 10. Mm. Uh, good question here from Kate. Does anyone need to be on site living at the land to be used? No, most most sites would not have a, 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 a live-in owner. But um, as Alex said, we would certainly recommend people around at key times. So arrival times, uh, you can obviously set your own arrival times, but also in the early evening, can be when issues can crop up. People have come back from their outings, and um, maybe there's, you know, the, the, the pitch nets to them has, has just arrived, and their guy rates are reaching into their pitch or what have you. Then, I, I personally, I would always advise people to be around uh, during that period. But the main thing is make sure that you have visible contact details. Make it very easy for people to get in touch with you, and also take into account the uh, risk of the property. So we've got a lot of resources on our website and we'll circulate the links afterwards, uh, which will give you a risk assessment template and various other guidelines on COVID and fire safety and so on. And clearly, if your land holding falls into one of those categories, there's going to be needs to be a bit more vigilance and it may need to be, it, it may well be that you need someone on site. Okay. Uh, Elizabeth asks, what is the current VAT situation for camping? Well, the government has waived VAT until I believe October. We've got an, an FAQ on it. Um, in the page that will circulate afterwards. Um, generally speaking, it complies with, uh, in a normal year, it would be 20% VAT. Um, but for the moment, I, I believe they've waived the amount completely. If you're ob Obviously, if you're above the VAT threshold, um, and then it's going to, I think it's 12.5% in October, and then back to 20% next year. Okay. Uh, we've got one other one here, but I think we've already covered this. What is the best way to promote your site online? I think yeah, I think we covered that one. Okay. Yep. Elaine asks... Where would you stand if you had an uh, if you had agreed for someone to be on your land, but they were then behaving in an antisocial manner, not sticking to the agreed rules? Well, first of all, I I would that's really where you you need to make use of the pitch up terms and facilities because you can head off many of these problems by making it absolutely clear that you, for example, you might not want groups, you might not want um, you know hen nights and stag days are very common. People don't want to accept those. Um, some, in fact, uh, a good number of our sites are adults only. Um, but if you do get in a position where someone arrives and you need to get rid of them, um, we, uh, I mean, really calling the police is, is, is the ultimate um, advice I can give uh, because, of course, generally uh, other campers will um, remonstrate with the, the, uh, the individual and, um, and, and almost always they will leave, leave of their own accord. But if that doesn't happen, then um, you can enlist the help of the authorities, you can notify us. So you know, we don't allow you to be blackmailed by bad reviews uh, by these individuals, and um, we will look out for that. Uh, we've That's all the, the sort of initial questions that we had during this, but we've actually got some more that I think were um, 
put in prior. So there's one here, which is 40 acres of woodland where we plan to put two shepherd's huts this summer, 40 acres of grassland. Um, that's not really a question. Amenities required. Oh, amenities required for a pop-up campsite. I think we've kind of touched on some of that already. Yep. Uh, uh, let me have a look and see. Should we go to the um, other rules different in Scotland? Oh, we, we cover that one. Yeah. Um, so, so, so yeah. Essentially, the, Scot the Scotland rules, are, as I mentioned, very similar to the Ir Northern Irish rules in that they they don't have a hard and fast rule, but they basically they're basically saying we don't expect um, draconian enforcement of of the twenty eight day rule. Um, but I but again. As you know, councils differ on their approaches, and so it's always worth a call. Uh, are long drop pit toilets permitted on these sites? Um, well, the um, environmental health rules would apply uh, to that, and as, as well as potentially environment agency issues, depending on the states of your land. Uh, so again, if you were planning to install this type of uh, facility, I would check with the environmental health whether it would be permissible, but in principle, it's okay. Um, I would say that, uh, that, you know, clearly there is going to be some customers who uh, might go to another site if, if um, they knew that was the facility, but um, it, it, it's not going to reduce your customer base to a negligible amount. Are there any grants available for initial costs as a, uh, a tenant dairy farmer's cash flow is tight to even invest? Um, good question. I mean, obviously things are changing with the whole Brexit regime with the basic payment scheme, um, being phased out and, um, I, there's the, there's rural payments grants, but I would suggest Googling for what's available in your area. The one thing I would say is that, um, you can do have a look at the local competition in your area for the, for, for, for tents, if that's what you're thinking of going for, but the returns can be quite rapid. So it's possible to have fairly low outlays and to be able to re re recover the cost of your investment fairly quickly. For remote camping spots, how do you manage the electricity and water supplies? Well, again, that would depend. You need to have a survey from, so we've got a, a list of um, electrical contractors on our website that you can find a local approved person from, um, and they will be able to give you a survey on um, essentially taking service from the nearest available spot and how much that would cost. Same how, okay. Uh, how do footpaths through fields affect option for pop-up campsites? Uh, well, if, I mean, it depends what type of footpath they are. If they're permissive, um, I'm afraid I, um, I, I I spent an entire week at a public rights of way inquiry at our, our, our place in North Devon. So, um, it, it, if it's a permissive path, then you know by definition you're giving permission for it to exist. And um, depending how long it's been a permissive path, then you potentially can can reroute it to accommodate a campsite. Um, I'm not sure how that would go down with um, the local uh, footpath users, but you'd have to take a view as to how long they've been using it. If it's a public right of way, then um, you, you pretty much have to leave it where it is um, because there wouldn't be time for a, you know, even if you wanted to go for a diversion order, for example, you you, you wouldn't get anything through in time for the summer. Um, so so those would need to be respected. Okay. But, 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 to, but to sort of answer, you know, in practical terms, we've, we've got lots of landowners where uh, campsites coexist with public rights away, and I, I certainly can't recall any complaints. Okay. How do you get planning permission? Um, well, I, I mean, I think we've we sort of touched on that in the slide earlier, but my my advice will always be, and we actually have a list of these in our how to start a campsite article, is to find a local planning consultant to guide you through the process. Um, they they may um, of course they cost cost more money than doing it yourself, but I think the complexity of the planning system you never know what it's going to throw up, um, and I think having a professional holding your hand is always a good idea. So um, it, it as I said, eight weeks is the um, it can happen sooner than you sooner than you think, and and these days many of the permissions are not decided by committee, they're decided by officers, um, and that that can mean that they go through relatively quickly. Um, I just take some of the ones in the yeah, in, in the top priority. section. Yeah. Um, so farms in Wales, I think we already touched on that. Wales um, last year they didn't have fifty six day rights; it was twenty eight. But last month they um, and I think I think um, in large part thanks due to lobbying by the CLA, um, they announced fifty six days in Wales. So that was great news. So effectively, that's the same as, as England. Do you need permission for local council? No, theoretically you don't because the planning permission already exists. But I would always I would always suggest people pick up the phone to local council because you never know what might be lurking in the files, whether it's an article four direction, or maybe the people you used to own the land have signed a, an agreement with the council to remove permitted development rights on a certain field, and you might not be aware of that. 
um, could speak as, okay, we've covered the National Park one, I think. Um, planning application, no, you don't need to do that. Um, does the 50th day rule allow for other purposes? Uh, it does. Um, so the actual legislation actually says for any purpose, but then it goes on to talk about all sorts of exceptions. So you can't use it for motor racing or um, uh, all sorts of weird and wonderful things. But I'll, um, I'll I'll put a link to to what it allows you to do. Essentially, you can't go and build things. You can you can use it for you know a, a car a beach car park for example would be another uh, temporary use. Is the 56 day rule permanent? No, it's going to last until the end of this year. But of course, our hope is that um, we can we can really make a success of this summer and see the benefits go not only to landowners who've had a, a tough time with their weddings, businesses, their festivals, their tourist attractions, their you know BPS um, being phased out, and 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 in in many parts of the agricultural industry, um, a decline in income going back over the last few years, but also the local communities in which they're based. Um, I'm from North Devon, and it's great to see that um, the uh, what we call the honeypot resorts. Um, this isn't really where these pop-ups are being set up. It's the more inland areas, so the likes of Exford, Umberley, etc. Um, these sort of uh, villages, um, either on or, or in the approach to Exmoor, and very often they would see uh, very little of the tourist pound. Um, and it's the village stores, the garages, the pubs. Um, the local tradespeople, the local high depots who are going to see the benefit from this. Um, so we very much hope to be able to, to be able to put together a good case towards the end of this year for its continuing into future years. Um, and certainly, touch wood, based on the couple of hundred sites that were live last year, the number of neighbour complaints and environmental issues was was extremely low. Um, I've heard that you need at least five acres to open up a pop campsite. Um, no, you don't. You don't actually. You, you can do it on um, any size of land. The only rule is that um, you can you cannot do it in the curtilage of a listed building. And if you're in the curtilage of a building, you can only do it for 28 days for tents. So there's no minimum land holding for it. Uh, licensing and legal, hopefully we've um, covered that one. Anything else? Having a look now. I think most of them. This is the one here. What is the absolute bare minimum facilities one has to provide to campers, tents only, yurts, or equivalent? Well, I suppose safe drink, drinking water, but I would really question the um, <clears throat> whether it's worth the time in not investing in those extra facilities, not only from a, um, an environmental health perspective and a, in, in, indeed a COVID perspective, because, because remember that COVID rules um, will apply to you. Uh, we've 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 got some helpful links in in our campsite guide, but um, not having those sorts of facilities um, do make it a bit harder for you to comply with those rules. Um, so I would always encourage people to to try and provide as many facilities as possible uh, within reason. Uh, one other one or two others here. What do we do if we can't take bookings and the field gets flooded? Or what do we do if we take bookings and then the field gets flooded, for instance? Uh, so we we had a number of sites last year who. Uh, were hit, as I said, in the in, in Cumbria, um, there were a few that were flooded uh, just before August Bank holiday. So um, <clears throat> many, uh, in, in fact, um, we're lucky to to work in the leisure industry because many of many customers over the last year have been very happy to amend their bookings with campsites rather than cancelling them completely and demand a refund. Um, so that's allowed. I, I'm convinced that many many of our clients have managed to stay afloat because of that. And um, so the first, yeah, the first. Um, step would be to to ask about amendments or maybe there's another part of your land that is not affected um and obviously we work with you to um to to to, to, to make the situation good um, chemical waste um i've just I've just seen a, a question on that so again i think you would um you would liaise with your chemical waste contractor uh to discuss uh, the best disposal for that and and um it may well be that the IBC containers are okay for chemical waste, um, but but um, your local uh, contractor can can advise on that. And we've got some links on uh, waste disposal in general in our How to Start a Campsite article. A couple of questions just asking to send out the information afterwards. This will all be communicated afterwards, so don't worry too much. Um, yeah. Let's see if there's anything else that we might want to. 
I think we've covered the rate, the rate, the ratio of toilets and showers. I think you sort of touched on that in your slide, didn't you? Mm -hmm. So there's a, um, so as Alex said, there isn't a hard and fast legal rule about pop-ups must have X toilets and X showers. So what we've done is we've taken the figures that Cornwall County Council recommend to their license holders, people who've got a camping license, and we've put those, uh, we've listed those on the page. So you can see that for 60 pitches, you need, you know, four toilets and four showers, but I'll, I'll, I'll circulate that afterwards. So you've got the actual figures. <clears throat> Um, a lot of questions about toilets, but we've already answered those. Yeah, um, there's another one saying we're in a national park, so permissive vermin doesn't count. So it it, it does count. Um, so you can you can get it in national parks. Uh, do we have to let the highways know? Um, I I mean, again, technically not, but um, I would certainly if if particularly if there's likely to be a highways if there w would have been likely to be a highways objection had it been a planning application, I would certainly advise. Um, doing that, uh, just, just, I think to you, you, the last thing you want is to have people on site, people turning up in the middle of, of, of July, only for highways to come along and say, actually, this access is completely unsuitable, and that th they have some sort of arcane power that allows them to um, to, to, to close your entrance or something. Uh, Becky asked, "Is permitted development something we have to apply for, or for to a local authority? If so, how do we get it?" No, it's not. It's it exists already, um, unless um, it's been removed by the the various um, Article Three, Article Four, Section One Hundred Six. So um, we'll, we'll 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 circulate the article afterwards, which, which explains what the criteria are for you to have it. But in general, land does has it have it. Um, sorry, land has it unless it's been removed for these reasons. Um, for tents, you need to cut the grass short. Um, well, uh, we, we, we would all, I mean, there's the, the rewilding thing is taken off, but um, we would definitely, um, yeah, basically, yes. Um, we, if you can, do so. Uh, if you have a borehole, does water have to be tested? Um, yes, absolutely. Yeah. Um. Terms and conditions that help to protect the farming business. Yeah, great question. So we've we've actually just um, Alex mentioned we're sending out the countryside code, but there's also a, a poster that you can put up, and that's part of that's within our frequently asked questions. So you can just print that off. It's a PDF, and then you can put it on the wall. And what we're hoping is that the combined effort of you know everyone getting the countryside code, and it's you know it's going to be over a million people this year who put a few pitch up. Um, you know they're not going to read a six-page document necessarily, but I think if we all put posters up, then we're going to go a good way towards. Um, uh, sh teaching people who may never have visited the countryside about leaving gates uh, as you found them and, and keeping your dogs on a lead and, and keeping on footpaths and so on. A uh, couple more just come in. Uh, can we ask visitors to take their waste home with them, Maria? Um, a couple of our site owners have tried to do that and it has not go gone down well with the local community for obvious reasons. Um, so we would always suggest uh, handling waste on site um, in fact, uh, as I said, there are some options, there are some uh, links in our FAQs and the how to start a camp campsite page to <clears throat> waste contractors. Um, but also remember that you can also save money by, uh, take, by um, offering recycling as well, because the cost per ton is that much cheaper. So even if you allow, even if you have a couple of extra bins, the ability to sort into different types of waste could, could bring that cost down significantly. A um, couple of final ones here. Is the in the past we've had friends with their tents, but the ground can be unpredictable where caravans are concerned. Can you choose to just take tents only? Uh, yes, and the fifty-six days would only give you tents. Um, and then the last couple here. Um, does adding electrical hookup and water source constitute development if drainage is delivered via composting means, or can this be done as per water? off through livestock without planning permission quite detailed. um I, th I think that's probably one for a planning consultant we, yeah. we we can't really that's kind of heading into legal advice really which we can't can't really offer and just finally it seems like the last one here would be where would you uh, where would we be making the slides available um it's, my understanding is is straight afterwards um yeah. well or at least tomorrow certainly by tomorrow yeah um, just, just another one that came up. Each of our fields has its own parcel number. So, from what you say, we can extend our season by using different fields. I would just, I would just tread carefully on that one because my understanding is it's quite rare that a landholding would be treated as different um, planning units, as they're called. Um, it might, as, as I said, it might be a major, a major road going through it. It might be a very large estate with different activities happening on it, and then it might qualify as different planning units. But generally speaking, single ownership would mean one planning unit, and therefore only one fifty-six day period. 
um, but, but check with the planning department. Um, I think we might have. I think. That's oh, 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 BPS. Um, I'll, again, we ha we have a, a free. So we try and add a new FAQ every time. Else, everyone else, uh, uh, every time we hear a new question. So thank you for all the interesting questions. But um, BPS. The answer is, uh, as you probably know, twenty eight days is the limit for non agricultural activities. So uh, if you're planning to open for more than that, you would need to fill out the form. There's a link to it on our website, which will notify the rural payments agency. That you're planning to go over it and it may be that you wouldn't be entitled to subsidy for that particular area of land um, but our understanding is that the amount uh, that you can earn from a campsite for uh, you know per acre is significantly more so hopefully that should not be too much of an issue um, can you clarify the 42 days for tents yes so um, the way to think of it is there are two completely different requirements you've got planning commission which is where the permitted development comes in and that's where, where the government has said in England and Wales, you can have up to 56 days without planning permission. And then you've got, a, you've got a completely separate requirement for a camping license. And that is triggered by having tents on the land for more than 42 days consecutively or more than 62 days, but sorry, more than, six, even my, more than 60 days non-consecutively. So if you wanted to use the 56 days that you've been given without planning for tents, you could have a period of 42 days say from the 20th of July to the 30th of August. And then you could have the remaining 14 days from the, uh, whatever it is, the 5th to 19th of July. What facilities need to be offered for parking? Um, I mean, technically none, but um, you, you probably don't want to be going for um, people coming on a bike only. So I, I mean, really just a, a, a field that's not going to get bogged down because you, you probably don't want to spend your your time uh, in the tractor pulling people out although i have to say some of the reviews are very complimentary about uh, when that has happened um <laughs> interesting way to get a 10 out of 10 review score um <clears throat> for people who come off the road to the campsite do you suggest a card payment system in place as some people do not carry so much cash yes i would definitely recommend that and, and as you know um the use of cards has just gone through the roof since covid um and 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 cash has, cash has um, gone the other way so if you can uh, and also, of course, the, you know, a lot of people turn up um, to the middle of Exmoor having drawn out 30 quid and then they burn through it with the um, extremely good value for money baskets of logs and eggs and so on that, that uh, you can offer them. So I would certainly suggest having card machines. And there are lots of companies around which allow you to download a card reader to your phone so you can have that running uh, very quickly indeed. Um, just FYI, the VAT is 5% and qualifies at the date of payment rather than date of redemption. redemption. Okay. Um, sorry. Yeah, that's my mistake. 5%. Yep. Yeah, so there's not a complete waiver of the VAT. Uh, it's 5% and um, it's correct. Yeah, 5% until the 30th of September 2021 and 12.5% from the 1st of October to the 31st of March 2022. And then it would come in at 20%. Uh, now, just a quick point on that one. Our um, commission is actually, um, a, a, we are the supplier to you. So because the commission that we're charging represents a uh, booking service, it doesn't qualify for the reduced rate of VAT. Um, so we would still be invoicing you 20%. So you'd be able to claim back 20% on the 15% commission. So effectively, it's 12.5% plus 20% VAT equals 15%. And you could reclaim that 2.5% if you're VAT registered. Does a shower toilet in an ISO contain any planning permission? Um, I, I, I'd have to Google that one, I'm afraid. I'm, I'm not sure. Um, the, the, the rule on showers and toilets, basically what the 56 day rule says is that movable um, move, movable units are permissible as part of the 56 days. Um, so they come under the umbrella of the 56 day permitted development. Is there a minimum size of land required? No. Um, can you ask, uh, does adding an electrical workup? I think we dealt with that yeah. one. I think we're done. I think that's pretty much all of them, yeah. Yeah. Do the 56 days have to be consecutive? Um, I, I just, I know we've touched on that before, but it's 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 a very good question and well worth just just reiterating. They do not have to be consecutive, but obviously if you have the portable toilets there and the showers there, effectively the, the clock is still ticking. So what the law really says is that you have to remove all use to stop the clock ticking. Um, so if, if you have the resources to 
Um, I mean, the bank holiday is gone now, but if you had the resources to have portable toilets and showers in place for the weekend and then take them away, that will then stop the clock run, running and then you could potentially come back on the 10th of July. Now, as I said, this year is an unusual year. So we're expecting uh, the weekends during June to be a lot more buoyant than they normally are um, because, of, because of so much pent up demand. Um, compensation if damage is caused, say a car reversed into my gate. Um, well, that's, thankfully that seems to be very rare, but um, it is possible to have a damage deposit. It's, it's normally only for accommodation. So if you have a camping pod or a static caravan or a lodge or something like that, and then you might retain some of their money. Um, but, but of course, there is also a, a pretty straightforward um, small claims option if, if, if it does come to that. Um, I have to say, I, I, I can't recall um, that coming up much at all last year, though. Have you had any problems with campfires? Um, no, there's, there's some pretty extensive guidance. I mean, you, you may have, there's been some um, very well documented problems with um, carbon monoxide poisoning uh, some years ago in the industry. And so um, there's some pretty, pretty decent guidance out there now on on handling fires together with um, uh, campsites and uh, caravan parks. So um, that's all listed on our website and you can have a browse through to make sure the risk is absolutely minimized. And then the last question was, I have a farm toilet for staff. Can the campers use this? Um, I mean, I COVID, um, there's, there's, there's deep cleaning guidance um, that's available. Again, it's linked from our website. So subject to COVID guidance being obeyed, um, that should be fine. And of course, the, of course, that then potentially gives you more flexibility to have different periods because you're not citing portable toilets and showers on the land that, that keep the clock running. Right. I think that's... Yeah, that think is, I think, all the, all the questions. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, everyone, for all your time. Thank you, everyone. Yeah, um, a bit of marathon, but... Um, always uh, always interesting um feels like whack-a-mole but um do do keep them coming and um if 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 anyone has any questions please feel feel free to email join at pitchup.com um and that'll come through to me and alex and we'll uh come back to you as soon as we can um and all the material is also available in the uh, resource center so in in your uh 